Hello, thank you for joining me on this web presentation. My name is Katie Luo. I'm an ophthalmologist at Mass Eye and Ear Harvard Medical School. I recently conducted a phase two clinic trial. Uh, I'm going to present the data to you here on the pre-recording. Because of the pandemic of COVID-19, I'm videoing, taping this now, but by the time you are watching this video, I will be answering your question live. So please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box while you're listening to my presentation. And I wanna point out that this is a presentation of the scientific results of the clinic trial. This is not a promotion for this product or the company. This investigational drug, progesterone 1%, has not been FDA approved. So 30 years ago, when someone diagnosed with blood cancer failed uh, chemotherapy, that was a death sentence. And since then, because the rapid improvement in stem cell transplant, many, many second chance of life been given to this population. However, although the uh, autograft works pretty well, the allogenetic graft, meaning getting the donor stem cell from another patient, uh, from another person, can cause chronic GVHD. That affects many organ systems, such as the skin, the lungs, the digestive system, and the eyes, and others. So when they were given the second chance for life, they're battling this very difficult condition Ocular GVHD affects at least 30 to 60% of this population. And they can happen either in conjunction with other systemic um, diseases or just independently, only affecting the eyes. It causes eye irritation, frank pain, and poor healing. It is immune-mediated destructive inflammatory disease. It is not just a severe dry eye. You can spot patients with ocular GVHD from a room full of people without any ophthalmology training. They look like they're squinting all the time or wearing sunglasses even in dim indoors. They put their hands over the brow and act like they don't know where the bathroom door is even if it's right in front of them. So, they can be evaluated in the ophthalmology clinic with the help of a slit lamp that's showing the right side of the slide. Through the slit lamp, we can see that a lot of them have blepharitis, which is the inflammation of the eyelids. The red swollen with ulcerated margin, a lot of crusting at the lash roots. More frequently, you will see what we call con keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctivitis the eyes look red, inflamed, and gunky, as if they have viral conjunctivitis. But that is not the same etiology. Ocular GVHD causes decreased tear production, decreased mybum production, which is the oil layer, and increased mucus discharge. They cause tissue inflammation and a decreased proliferative uh, activities. In ophthalmology, we use a stain called fluorescein to show up the ocular surface damage at the slit lamp. On these pictures, you see many green little dots. These dots are not supposed to be seen on the regular healthy surface. They are there because there's tissue damage. We quantify these green dots to assess the severity of the damage that's made to the ocular surface. Sometimes you will see these stuck up appearance of mucus dots. They almost look like skin tags. They are an extension of the epithelium that's growing in the wrong direction after ocular surface damage. These are extremely painful and cause a lot of light sensitivity. When the disease progresses, when the proliferation does not meet 
uh, the speed of destruction, we see frank denuded epithelium on the cornea and conjunctival surface showing us the green in this picture. And sometimes the cornea can just perforate. There can be a hole that happens within days. We can put a small piece of a donor cornea there to sew it up, patch it up, but that's not the end of the story. I've seen plenty of patients, even after graft, the melt continue to happen either next to the graft or on the new graft. Sometimes we see large areas of involvement in the geographic area that's on the slide showing blue border. The whole area is very thin and full of neovascularization and any point can perforate at any time, it is difficult to repair because of the location. Currently, there's not a lot of uh, available medical treatments for ocular GVHD. There's generalized lack of standing, not only in the general community, but even in uh, our ophthalmology field. This is because lack of exposure to such patients. Oftentimes, these patients were told they have severe dry eyes and they were treated with uh, dry eye uh, treatment such as artificial tears, um, which is pretty good for a normal dry eye patient, but some of these can cause damage to ocular GVHD surface. For example, the over-the-counter preservative containing bottled artificial tears, when used too frequently, it can cause surface toxicity. Uh, the common treatment of cyclosporin, which is restasis, uh, zydra, they work in some mild dry eye patients, but rarely works in severe GVHD patients. Topical steroids is a great tool to use, but very careful tapering schedule and maintenance are required. Serum tears is a great choice, but it is labor intensive to obtain and financially costly. Punctal plugs are very helpful in general, but often underutilized in general practice. Warm compress is good for blepharitis, but the common practice of lid scrub is just too much for those ulcerated delicate tissue. These patients unfortunately suffer very painful eyes and have no quality of life despite given a second chance for life. Despite all the trials that's been run, or uh, attempted or currently going, there is no FDA approved treatment for ocular GVHD at this time. Dr. Eamon did a very neat animal study to show that when 1% progesterone cream was applied on the forehead of a rat, 25 minutes later, the sensitivity to cornea painful stimuli decreases as shown in the uh, progesterone column there. The painful stimuli can be quantified by the amount of strength used to poke the cornea to cause a painful reaction. In lacrimal gland excised animals, the result persists. That tells us such analgesic effect is at least partially independent of a tear production function. So such effect exists at 55 minutes after the application, at almost two hours after the application, and even stronger. Each time point was done with 12 animals, one eyeball per animal, and the same results were seen with other painful stimuli such as hypertonic saline or capsaicin solution. How does it work? Looks like the sensory neuron on the forehead is the immediate pathway to conduct this um, treatment effect. When bupivacaine, which is a long-lasting anesthetics, was injected subcutaneously to the forehead, it blocks the progesterone effect completely, as shown on the left side graph. When you take the same amount of progesterone, put it on the rat's cheek, it does not work. It says there's no systemic absorption related effect. Further, 
Dr. Men looked at the brainstem trigeminal nucleus area. To simplify this slide, just think about the caudal zone as an area associated with painful stimuli. And the rostral zone is associated with a blinking and tearing response. On the right-sided picture, when there's no stimulation uh, on the cornea, application of progesterone increases the neuronal activities in the area associated with blinking and tearing. In the painful stimulation, um, with the painful stimulation, it brought the bars to equal height. And when you look at the caudal area, that is where the painful stimuli translates to, progesterone application decrease the painful activity um, in the brainstem area. So this gives us a hint to how it might work. The progesterone actually has a very rapid onset, so likely it stimulates the reaction from the brainstem level through a direct neuronal loop, but it has not been proven yet. So uh, we took the progesterone to human study. This is a single center, randomized, a double mask, placebo controlled phase two trial with 33 patients and 66 eyes. Randomization, the active to placebo um, ratio was two to one. All participants are non-pregnant adults with stable chronic GVHD systemically. No, uh, none of them had uh, the need to have immunosuppression adjustment at the beginning of the study. They are all status post allogenetic chemopoietic stem cell transplant. They have NIH consensus score of ocular GVHD at least two. If they have severe comorbidities, such as retinal detachment or high intraocular pressure, they were excluded from the study. Contact lens, scleral lens wear are excluded. And anybody who was enrolled in any other clinic trial at the same time were excluded. The key study design was to control the variables. As we know, the eye symptoms are highly related to the environmental um, uh, changes. So all the participants got their systemic immunosuppression stable during trial. They kept their ocular treatment that was pre-enrollment stable through the trial. No elective procedures such as cataract surgery or even punctal plug placement was allowed during the trial. We designed the study in a block fashion rather than the enrollment, uh, ongoing enrollment fashion to control the environment variables. After they were screened and randomized, all the patients were started with the treatment or placebo within two weeks of each other. And the randomized portion lasted 10 weeks. So week zero, they were brought into the office under direct supervision, apply the first dose on their forehead to ensure the correct application. And then took the drug home and applied twice a day, every single day, and recorded their application on daily diary. We brought them back to clinic at week two, six, and 10, as well as some of the visits at Dana-Farber for systemic evaluation. At the end of week 10, on mask was done to the examiner and the participants at the same time. 21 of the 22 active group participants completed study with one loss to follow up. They all elected to continue on with the treatment in the open label phase. All 11 participants in the control group completed the randomized phase and they all elected to cross over to get the active treatment. So now they are uh, doing the open label phase. The primary efficacy measurements were Sandy questionnaire. That is a valid validated questionnaire using ophthalmology to assess 
the severity and frequency of dry eye symptoms. The other primary efficacy measurement was fluorescing surface staining, as I showed you earlier, those green dots. Safety monitoring was done with ocular exam in standard fashion in ophthalmology clinic, as well as systemic exam done in the uh, BMT clinic with basic blood work and endocrine panel. Our participants are a good mixture of female and male. Their age ranges between 24 years and 75 years. Their uh, stem cell transplant happened somewhere 10 months to 21 years ago. Most of them had peripheral blood stem cell transplant. A small proportion had a bone marrow transplant. Ocular history-wise, they're pretty well matched too. Cataracts are very common um, effect after steroids treatment that few of them can avoid during the bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. Some of them had cataract surgery already. Uh, most of them had punctal plug placed on preservative free artificial tears and topical steroids as part of the common treatment. Few of them are on restasis. When the study result came back, we were very happily surprised. As you can see here, the active groups are in blue and the placebo group is in orange. The frequency and the severity score, the product of these two is called the global scores on the left side of this chart. The longer the bar is going south, the better the result is because we're accounting for the improve in symptoms. So most, if not all of the bars are significantly different with these two colors, telling us how great a relief collectively the active group of patients felt compared to the placebo group. We ask other specific symptoms such as light sensitivity, blurred or cloudy subjective vision, they all had great improvement as early as 30 to 60 minutes after the first application. When we asked their other symptoms a dozen different ways, they all came back positive. Foreign body sensation, ocular pain, airflow sensitivity. At various time points, the control group uh, sometimes felt some improvement too, but the majority of improvement you're seeing is in the blue active group. When we look at the ocular surface objectively behind the slit lamp, so this is not a patient report, this is observed by a um, masked observer, examiner, uh, look at the density of the green dots on the cornea surface, we can see that as early as two weeks, we see statistically significant improvement in the cornea surface damage in the active group. We also look at other categories such as lid redness, lid swollen, swollen lids, uh, lid margin ulceration, conjunctival redness. Uh, again, at various time points, we see the significant changes, improvements in the active group. So that was a collective response. Now we look at this a different way. We look at what percentage of subjects responded. So let me walk you through this complicated slides. If a patient, a subject with two eyes, reports equal or greater than 50% improvement in at least one eye, we call that subject a responder if he or she reported less than 50% in either eye, even if it was 49%, we call this a non-responder. So when we compare the response in total cornea fluorescing staining, those green dots, we see that, for example, at six weeks, 27% in the placebo group said they, they're responders, and 67% um, are responders in the treatment group. Similar results are at 10 weeks. When we look at the patient's subjective report, Sandy score, it's even more dramatic difference. 
at six weeks, 9% of the placebo group thought they responded that much, and 67% in the treatment group responded. A similar trend um, stays at 10 weeks. So this is a tear scan showing you the tear film um, on the subject's cornea surface. See, at week 10 after treatment, at, the, at week zero, before the treatment, there's a thin layer of oil in front of the cornea. At week 10, we see that oil, that uh, wavy layer is much, much thicker. So we do believe progesterone increased the production of mabin and tear. However, this result, uh, as of now, could not be quantified because of lack of standardized uh, quantification methods. This drug is very safe. In our clinic trial, zero severe adverse effect was seen in the active group, while two severe adverse events uh, occurred in the control group. One patient had a heart attack. Unfortunately, the other patient suffered a sudden cornea melt, not on treatment. There was no significant change in their visual acuity, their intraocular pressure. There is no significant changes found in any of the standard ocular exam. They also did very well systemically. The endocrine panel are shown below. The serum progesterone level did not change in men or women in the active treatment group. However, the control group did show some decrease in progesterone, both in men and women, which I cannot explain. We need a larger group to study in our phase three trial. Total and free testosterone, FSH and LSH, LH did not show any change. ACTH, again, did not show change um, in women, but it did show there's some change in men, uh, placebo and active group, mostly driven by a dip in the control group, which again, I could not explain. In conclusion, the forehead application of 1% progesterone twice a day on the forehead significantly improve ocular symptoms and signs in 10 weeks or less amount of time in a group of patients with ocular graft versus host disease. It is very effective as shown. 67% of the subjects had symptom reduction of 50% or more, at least in one of their two eyes in the active group versus only 27 were found in the placebo group at 10 weeks after the treatment. A multi-centered large randomized phase three trial is in active planning. We have unanswered questions and a future direction. We need to understand the long-term efficacy and safety by continuing to follow the current group in the open label phase. We are doing multivariate analysis uh, to look for predictors of response. And we also understanding the mechanism of action with both bench research and clinic study. I want to thank my mass and year team who worked tirelessly side by side to ensure high quality of the study. I also want to thank our Dana-Farber team of attendings, nurse practitioners, and secretaries with your tireless work and close collaboration to allow this trial to happen in such effective way. Right now, they're taking care of a very group, very vulnerable group of patients in the COVID-19 pandemic. Hats off to them. Last but not least, I wanna thank the GLIA team, our inventors, supporters, uh, sponsor, chauffeur. They do everything to make this trial happens smoothly. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer your question live now. Thank you.
In summary, a dual mechanism, pain reduction and tear film stabilization question mark, which one would contribute to a 10 week results? This is an excellent question. So seems like from my observation, so the pain reduction in some uh, subjects, not all of them, they can have a very rapid onset, like within 30 minutes. At, that, at 30 minutes, uh, we really don't see anything objectively because you know nothing happens that quickly except the patient's sensation changes. So the 10-week results, I feel, is probably, again, without scientific proof, but I think most likely it's because there's increased tear film, there's increased myban um, secretion, and with a more, um, with a better tear film quality, there's more healing that is allowed to repair the epithelium. So then truly at 10 weeks, not only we're seeing the analgesic effect of pain reduction, we're also seeing truly healing that's happened. So there is truly less pain by 10 weeks. All right, so I'm going to uh, keep going. Please keep the questions coming. I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Next question, will this be available outside of the United States? So that's a great question. So I think the company uh, is also working internationally. Uh, I don't know the details of the other international uh, progress at this moment, but I believe this is a global effort to uh, provide this treatment to GVHD patients. Um, next question. I find this... Uh, therapy novel in the application of the medication to the forehead. Have you treated anyone else with active ocular GVHD with topical application of steroids to the forehead? That's a great question. Um, yeah, this is the application is not only very novel, but absolutely easy for patients to adopt. So um, I have not tried with uh, any other medicine, you know, because even though this is uh, progesterone is widely used um, at much, much higher dose in many other specialties, such an application is still considered not FDA approved. There's no other FDA approved application of any other drug on the forehead um, other than, you know, probably um, topical treatments for skin conditions. So no, I have not scientifically treated anybody else, but this application is so acceptable to the patients. Some of them said it feels just like putting a uh, moisturizer on the skin every morning, every evening. It does not feel like any extra burden to do this at all. So it, this is way better than usual, usually the ocular uh, uh, installation of any eye drops. So uh, next question is, were the endpoints measured before and after crossover? That's a great question. Yes, so the, it was measured. Uh, we only have 11 patients. So let's look at the slide. Let's look at, uh, let's look at the slides here. Um, Let's advance to slides number 40, please. Can we put up slide number 40, please? Okay. Yes, so thank you. So at the slide number 40, you can see we did do analysis uh, of some key points, not every single point yet, for the crossover group. So there is a trend. If you look at the orange line, that's the control. And the blue line, that's the active group. And at 10 weeks, the uh, orange turned into blue because they started getting the active treatment. See, the lines are going down, both in the Sandy, the patient subjective sensation, the global score, and the total fluorescing staining that's observed by ophthalmologists. However, the arrow bars are huge. I mean, there are only 11, there are only 11 subjects and only the crossover was only done six weeks. So that, that's just to give us a sense, uh, see, you know, would uh, 
the active uh, with the placebo group also be able to respond to treatment. I think we got a very positive direction. Next question. What is the placebo formulation? That is a great question. So, so I personally, um, you know, uh, did not uh, manufacture the placebo, but per report, it is absolutely the same formulation compared to the 1% progesterone, except there's no progesterone put in there. So I know this is an aqueous-based gel. Uh, I do not know the exact chemicals in that formulation. Uh, this is a secret belong to Galea. Next question. With the symptoms that improved pain in 30 minutes, was this seen in the placebo group? I don't think so. I don't think so. Per my personal recollection, I don't think so. But let's look at the slides. So let's um, let's advance to let's uh, not advance. Let's go back to slide number twenty-five, please. Okay. Let's look at slide number twenty-five. So we plotted. Let's see, this is a photophobia. Well, actually, see, I take that back. So there is, uh, in the light sensitivity test, so at uh, a post-dose, that is 30 to 60 minutes post-dose, so some people did report improvement, yeah. Uh, in the blurred or cloudy vision, there's a very minimal reported uh, improvement at 30 to 60 minutes. Let's go to next slide, please. Slide number 26, please. Okay, so yeah, uh, excellent question. I didn't even pay attention to that. Yeah, the, there was placebo effect immediately after application. Absolutely right, because you know, uh, the patients were masked, the, 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 the examiner were masked, I guess. There could be imaginary um, results, absolutely. Okay. So, um, in general, with uh, let's go back to slide number, yeah, number twenty-four. I don't think we plotted the thirty minutes response. No, we did not. All right, next question. In the slide, it's shown 67% uh, response rate from week six to 10, while 33% uh, non-response. Can you explain this more? It shows, okay, so let's go to slide number 29, please. All right, so. So this is saying, so yeah, so th this slide is a little busy. I try to simplify it, but it's very busy. So let's focus on looking at, um, um, looking at the Sandy Global score on the right side of the slide. And let's go to six weeks where the result is circled with, an, with, a, with a red circle. So this one says, if we just go to the progesterone column, let's focus only in that one column, where all the numbers are blue. So this one basically says at six weeks, 14 patients out of 22 of them in the active group, 14 of them reported, they feel there's at least 50% 50, 50 improvement in at least one eye, okay? So this could mean both eyes are feeling greater than 50% or just one eye feeling greater than 50%, the other eye does not, but 14 of them said it's working, at least for one eye. 33% of them, seven patients out of 22 of them said no, neither eye had at least 50% improvement. This could mean, no, there's no improvement whatsoever, or it could mean, yeah, there's improvement, it's just not that big enough. It, I wouldn't call it 50% improvement. So that's what it means. So at 10%, uh, at 10 weeks, uh, such ratio stayed. Were those the same patients? Uh, the 14 that's responded continued to be the responder at 10 weeks? I don't, I, I, I would not say I have that data, but my hint is if not all of them, 
it's probably in the majority of them. So that on the side that tells us some, some of the um, effects probably are very prominent um, at six weeks already. Next question. Have other sex steroids proved to be effective in tear film stabilization in eye disease like dry eye? So a lot of uh, research showing that uh, the sex hormones can have some implication in dry eye. Usually that's uh, the studies done say with the hormonal um, replacement therapy, also asking their dry eye symptoms. So those, um, those studies are nothing is this black and white, nothing is, this um, convincing that it works. Also, again, no other sex steroids ever been done on the forehead in any study. Next question, is the effect on uh, myban mediated via neuronal feedback or systemic distribution of progesterone? Do we know? That's excellent question. So the first part of the question, is it mediated by neuronal feedback? So here, Again, disclaimer, it's not proven scientifically. This is just by my personal observation in seeing these patients. Some quick responders, you can see the tear film changing upon the very first application. I'm talking about naive subjects, never had this before. Upon a visit, um, at visit uh, one, when they apply the dose, we observe them 30 to 60 minutes later, in some, you can really see that myban secretion already started. So I would say at least that there is a component of neuronal feedback. Is there any systemic distribution of progesterone? I would say likely um, there is, there's definitely going to be a little bit of systemic absorption, but the, the amount is very, very little. As we've shown in the endocrine panel, there's no significant uh, increase in the level of uh, serum progesterone after 10 weeks of persistent treatment. Also in the rat study, uh, when the same amount of progesterone put on the cheek, it really doesn't work. So, so I think it's probably more of a neuronal feedback rather than a chronic accumulative dose of progesterone, but that's an excellent question. Next question, how does this help the doctors perform cataract surgeries or other procedures? That is a great question. As I mentioned earlier, let's go to slides. Um, let's go to slide. Slide number 23, please. So on slide number 23, you can see a lot of them have cataracts, right? This is, has nothing to do with the study. They, they came in with cataracts is because they've had bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant, steroid use typically follows those transplant and a lot of the subjects, we're talking about the large dose, chronic treatment, people frequently can be on 40 milligrams a day, 60 milligrams a day if they have a flare up of a GVHD. So they develop cataracts faster and uh, worse than the general population. And it's hard to do their cataract surgery because they have a very poor ocular surface. Remember those green dots? And uh, for the pictures that you're seeing, they're not bad because at least those, uh, the patient is able to open the eye, tolerate a photo shoot. The, in the worst cases, there's no way you get any slit lamp photo of them. They can't open their eyes. So they have poor healing. So cataract surgeons, turn them away, said, You're, this is just too dangerous to do a cataract surgery because it won't, might not heal. Uh, it might uh, cause endophthalmitis, it might cause wound leak. So having uh, in this group of patients, a lot of them, they already had cataracts and we are now six months after our uh, conclusion, our randomized portion, I've actually, done quite many cataract surgery on these patients. Otherwise, I was, hesitant to, uh, I was hesitating before just because of the high risk. When their surface gets more improved, not only the surgery itself is safer, the postoperative healing is better, 
it is much easier to get the biometry. They can open their eyes. They can withstand the examination. So I can know their axial lens and they have more uh, reliable case for cal uh, calculation of the lens power. So among you, if there's any cataract surgeon, you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to do surgery if you don't know where to aim them. You don't want them to turn out to be plus three postoperatively, right? So yeah, this is a great, I think that this will be really good for patients uh, who need a cataract surgery to get their surface stabilized first. Next question. Um, can you tell at this point of study, what layer of the tear film improves the most? Or all three layers improve in general for patients to report improvement in their symptoms? This is an excellent question. So, uh, Typically, we understand the tear films made of a liquid, a, a aqueous face, which is uh, produced by the lacrimal gland, the watering component, and the my, mybum layer, which is the oil layer produced by the meibomian glands. They live on the lid margins. They are tubes secreting oil constantly into the tear, tear film. And there's also a mucin layer, which is in, uh, produced by the goblet cells. They live in the conjunctiva. So GVHD patients, uh, it's all messed up. You have less aqueous tear, less oil, but a lot of mucin. So they end up having a lot of mucus, but very, very dry. So in my observation uh, of, the, of the study patients, look like it's a overall improvement of all three layers, meaning the quality, the quantity, the ratio, all improved. They have less mucus, more oil, more liquid in the responders, so the surface is better. I suppose there could be a change in the chemicals in the tear film too. So cytokines, chemokines, uh, inflammatory factors, they all secreted into the tear. Uh, we should uh, measure those in our future studies because I think the overall, the components of the tear film, they're normalized uh, to make the tear a lot better overall. Next question. Current trial shows a benefit out of 10 weeks. What is plan for next trial of lengths of dosing benefit and a target for commercialization? Excellent question. So uh, the phase two trial is really a, um, so we, we, I didn't know what I was gonna see. I didn't know if it was gonna work. I didn't know if it works or how it will work. You know, So 10 weeks, uh, I think we got a pretty good response. So to make sure we catch the lay responders, like I said, some people respond immediately. Some people took a few weeks to respond and um, we want to capture more because possibly there are some late responders uh, based on our follow-up information. So we are thinking of doing 12 weeks in the phase three trial and the dosing would be the same. The twice a day forehead application seems to be a pretty good dose. Uh, the target for commercialization, that's going to be a question for um, for our sponsor, Glia. So, you know, there is a invitation email that you received to join this talk. If you reply to that uh, invitation at Glia, so please direct any question that I have not answered today or future questions, related questions to me, to the company, please feel free to simply reply to that invitation email we will answer all of the questions coming through email. I think so far, I have addressed all the questions that I see here. I'm happy to stay online if you have any more questions. Uh, yes, another question. Another, a few more questions came in. Okay, so next question. Do you think patients with a more compromised meibomian gland function, lung disease, for example, may not respond as well? Question mark. Are there any GVHD patients in the status? Question. That's a great question. So, um, 
I know exactly what you mean. Some of the patients, we look at the meibomian glands and look all dead, like you squeeze them, nothing comes out, right? Those patients, like, would you able to stimulate any expression there? Um, I, I did think about this as I was conducting the trial. I think to my surprise, some of, some of the lids I thought was just hopeless, were just gone. They responded. They, so I, I distinctively remember a few patients, uh, they had uh, like a very red beady lids. Nothing could be squeezed out of them whatsoever previously. And uh, after, they didn't improve in immediately or in two weeks. I think those people responded later in the trial. They had, um, they had less swelling, less uh, redness on the lids. They actually, I can't say for every single individual because I don't have the data in front of me, but in my recollection, I was quite surprised that the lids improvement were very good. So does it mean there were some uh, meibomian glands were just, just not working, but then it could still be woken up? Or does it mean the, the, uh, the ducts were completely shut, but somehow with treatment with less inflammation, the duct can reopen and let the oil out? These are definitely questions I want to study. Next question. Um, do you anticipate any issues with combining the treatment with the topical anti-inflammatory uh, prescription? They seem complementary mechanism. Okay, you are a genius. You are absolutely right. I definitely think the combination works beautifully. So I previously, you know, before um, um, the trial, I was treating a lot of my patients with uh, mild um, Steer, topical steroids ointment, uh, particularly Lodamax ointment or FML ointment on the lid to help um, with their symptoms. So I do find the combination work very, very well. Yes. Next question. Um, no, uh, there's no next questions. Uh, are there any progesterone receptors in the lacrimal gland, or is the effect purely a neuronal stimulation of the gland? I think it's a, a neuronal stimulation of the gland. As we know, the, the location of the lacrimal gland is uh, you know, in the orbit, it's behind the bones and the upper, upper uh, outer corner above the eyeball. So where we apply the progesterone, uh, Arno, can you please advance to the very last slide, please? Very last slide. Let's see. Okay, yes. Uh, so this slide shows where the application is, right? So the application is on the, really on the forehead. It doesn't even touch the brow. So there is no direct contact between the application site to the lacrimal glands. Any case the, for the drug to reach the lacrimal gland, there has to be a direct pen tissue penetration and gets into the orbit. I don't think that is happening. We see response as soon as like a minute, two minutes after the application. I think that goes through the neuronal transmission back to the brainstem and brainstem comes out to the lacrimal gland. That is how it works. This is my personal interpretation. We do not have experimental data there, just so purely by timing and the way of, uh, you know, the, the, the anatomical relationship of these, um, of these organs. I, I think that's the case. Okay, very good. I'm very happy to see there are so many questions and uh, please feel free to, to keep the questions coming if there's any. And uh, of course, please uh, feel free to submit your questions through the reply to the invitation email to Michael. Another question just came in. 
And it says, uh, what percentage of treated patients experienced transient headaches? That is a great question. So uh, let's go to slide, let's see, go to, I'm going to give you a slide number to look at. So please go to slide number 45, please. Slide number 45, we have the, um, have slide number 46, please. No, that's not it. Uh, then slide number 44, sorry, the, the, these, these are tiny. Right, there, okay. So, so here uh, we collected, they, they keep a daily diary, so they report any and all symptoms, related, unrelated, whatever, uh, to us back through daily diary. So there we documented five patients out of total 22 in the proocular group, the actually I would say it's uh, five out of 21 because one uh, lost to follow up reported there was slight headache. In the placebo group, one reported that. So I would say only five. Um, and, uh, you know, these five, I'm, I cannot say all of them, the headaches are definitely related to the application, I would say up to five, up to uh, the 22%, 23% of patients, my experience a mild headache. None of them reported any severe headaches. Only, only saying, oh yeah, because we asked them, right? Do you have any headaches? Do you feel any sting sensation, any tight sensation of forehead? So they say, yeah, yes, a little bit. The some, a few of them, let's go to slide 45, please. Yes, so for some of them also reported a little bit of a runny nose. They report as a clear liquid coming out of the nose. Again, some of these are might be related, some of these are not, because in GVHD patients, some of them, they have chronic um, runny nose. Some of them actually, in the study, when the eyes stopped hurting, they reported their running, their chronic runny nose actually improved. So there's really not any significant discomfort reported by any of the subjects getting active treatment, including the crossovers uh, from the placebo group later. Another question. Yeah, the other question is uh, also on the headache. So I replied uh, already. I can understand MOA. Do you think there is a, a God control theory? So you can understand the mechanism of action. That's excellent. Um, uh, we have to say we do not know the exact mechanism of action at this point. We have some, um, we have some uh, speculation, we have some hypotheses, we have some uh, understanding from the animal studies uh, done in the rats, but to tie everything together, I think we're probably at the tip of the iceberg um, to understand a brand new, brand new um, paradigm to understand a whole mechanism of the forehead application of the medication. So let's see. Um, I am not sure what the, the God control theory is. Did you mean gate control theory? Is that a typo possibly? 
Okay, so I think, yeah, the, the, the gate control theory possibly is involved. Again, we don't have, uh, we don't have a whole lot of data on this yet. So hopefully future studies um, studying animal models will give us a better understanding there. So there's another question about uh, dosing here. Let's look at the la very last slide, please. Okay, so dosing is very small. So each dose coming out of the pump, you see that little uh, dot of gel on the fingertip, that's about the size. That size contain 0 0.7 milligrams of progesterone. So that is 600 microgram of progesterone in that one squeeze. And of that, only less than 5% would penetrate through the top layer of the skin uh, per the preclinical study. So that means is, let's say even if 10% gets through, we're gonna get seven, 70 micrograms. That is a very, very, very low dose. Uh, the next question coming is, um, was the study easy to recruit? Could the study be run through telemedicine given the current pandemic? That's an excellent question. So uh, to answer the recruitment question, so patients, first of all, patients are more than willing to participate. So when uh, we screen the patients, they were all very enthusiastic. Everybody wanted to be in because a lot of them are doing pretty well otherwise, and the eyes are just decreasing their quality of life. So they, they know the uh, progesterone as a safe medication has been around for many years. They know the application is very simple. There's not a lot of burden. So in that sense, recruitment is very easy. You don't have to persuade a patient to join. The difficulty with the recruitment is, uh, is that these patients are uh, with chronic GVHDs. So some of them, let's say, are going through all sorts of flare-ups. Say like someone's got a lung flare-up and they have to go through a, a high-dose steroid taper systemically, then we cannot recruit them. If we know they are 60 milligrams of prednisone now, they're going to go down to 40 next week. We just cannot recruit them. So, and because of the other criteria, I would say if you have a large uh, population and they, um, you have a relative group of uh, relatively stable patients, then the recruitment would be pretty easy. Can a study be run telemedicine? I, uh, it is hard because it takes the slit lamp exam to really see the cornea surface to see how uh, how they do, yes, per patient report, you can do telemedicine. They can tell you how they feel. But for the uh, objective observation part, it'll be pretty difficult in our current uh, condition to do telemedicine part. Uh, whether it would be possible to just do a phase, to do a trial without observation, just per, purely per report, it'll be difficult through FDA. Uh, once the pandemic is under control, then once the patients can get back to clinic being examined, I think we would be able to quickly move to clinic study phase three. Currently, all the patients who are still in the open label phase, so we are about 30 of them still, still actively on since uh, July 2019, so they're still on it. So we are continuing to collect their data. All right, so it's a, a little over one o'clock. I am very happy to be able to have the opportunity to present the data and communicate with you, answering uh, all the questions so far. I wish you all be very well and uh, take care of yourself in this pandemic. And uh, let's uh, think about what we can do 
even you're quarantined or isolated at home, what we can do to make this world a better place. I will uh, connect back with you if you submit any questions through Michael and uh, hopefully to meet you in the near future. Thank you very much.